Hello everyone and welcome to this week's webinar. I'm Nick Garden, Manager of Derivatives here at the NZX. Um, this week I'm really looking forward to sitting down with Bjorn Oste, who's the co-founder of Oatly, um, the Swedish oat milk, uh, sorry, oat drink company, um, that's leading the charge as uh, oat milk continues to grow its share, both in alternative dairy as well as the fresh milk categories around the world. Um, although Oatly's success has been meteor meteoric, um, it's only one part of Bjorn's story. Um, really, he's a serial entrepreneur, a thought leader, and an investor right across food and agri-tech. Uh, in today's session, we'll dive into Oatly's journey. It's been it's been a, a long time in the making. Um, we'll look at where plant based uh, where the plant based milk market is tracking, and uh, we'll also look at some of the barriers and opportunities for for that sector um, to increase their market share of coffee cups and cereal bowls around the world. Uh, we'll also have a look at Bjorn's views on on dairy and and its and how it's going to impact uh, nutrition into the future. Um, for those of you who have joined our webinars before, forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but uh, the troubleshooting and housekeeping piece is important. We'll be taking questions throughout the webinar, so you just pop them into your panel on the uh, on your, your um, sorry your rather your go to webinar app in the question section there. Uh, if you're having trouble hearing us, there's some troubleshooting on the left of your screen now. Um, sometimes if you can't get um, this uh, audio happening on your laptop or PC, you can um, dial in on your phone and it works generally pretty well. Or if all else fails, you can pick up the recording afterwards, which we'll be sending out. Um, so Bjorn, welcome and hello. How are you? <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm doing yeah. well, thank you. Uh, considering what's going on over in this part of the world these days, I think the whole world is probably engrossed uh, in in the U.S. election at the moment. Um, so I think it's probably a topical icebreaker to start with. Yeah, what's the feeling on the ground in, uh, on the West Coast? Uh, on the West Coast, you know, it's a deep blue state. So I think a lot of people around here. I should say first, I'm not American, so I I can't vote. I'm not. I'm here as an observer, right? Swedish neutral observer. But but uh, in California, I think a lot of people here wonder what what's going on in the rest of the country, right? Uh, they're, they're, uh, but uh, we are all waiting for the result. It's a nail biter right now, and, and nobody knows where it's going to go. It's it's a wide open uh, uh, election so far, and uh, I think people are nervous. Uh, people are. Uh, you know, feeling uh, worried about be, be, of the because of the uncertainty about the situation. Mm. It would have been a decisive victory one way or the other. I think would have been preferred by everybody. But now we're in sort of a limbo here, and and who knows where this is going to go. Yeah, it's a uh, it's been a nail biter, all right. And the you know the lead is changing hands, and it's a, it's it's pretty exciting to watch. I guess um, there's probably as far as elections go, uh, it's right up there. But um, we'll, we'll put that to bed now and move on to really the meat and potatoes of what we're here to talk about. Um, I guess the, the, it's probably fair to say that Oatly's journey, um, it hasn't really been an overnight success. Um, rather, it's, you know, it's been a journey, really. Um, 25 years since, since um, you sort of started to commercialise um, uh, the product. So can you tell us a little bit about you know where Oatly's come from and, and where it's at and what have been the sort of highlights and lowlights. Um, yeah, well, I could take uh, the, the tell you the full story will take uh, much longer than the, the time we have right here. But but uh, the short of it is that it's um, you know it's really my brother's fault. Everything had it not been for his uh, tinkering in the lab, we wouldn't have this conversation right now, and, and we would be you know minding our other businesses. But but uh, my brother is a professor in food chemistry at Lund University, and, and uh, when he was a young student there, he studied under uh, Professor Dahlqvist, so, so his, his professor then, famous for discovering lactointolerance. So, as we say, it's a, lactointolerance was a Swedish invention discovered in the 1990s. I'm sorry, 1960s, of course. And, and so my brother came in there uh, later and worked and studied under uh, in this group of scientists where milk always was looked upon as an issue, right? And Sweden, very much like New Zealand, is a very strong dairy culture, very strong dairy country. Um, 
with very high consumer uh, acceptance and, 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 and of course very low prevalence of lactose intolerance, right? So, so he started at the fringe end of looking at, okay, uh, so there are people with milk protein allergies and, and then there are some vegans running around and how do we service them? And, and, and also always with the look at that, well, lactose intolerance is actually maybe not an issue in, in Sweden or New Zealand, but globally it's a big deal. So there's really uh, uh, all the reasons to look for an alternative to cow milk. Uh, and, and he saw the soy milk market start to develop in the late 80s and put, pulled together a team of scientists to start looking at what plants would actually make the best source for making a dairy, like a dairy-like product, right? That's, that has the, the dairy is the only liquid that has the three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrates, right? And, and as we say, unfortunately, beer doesn't have that because if it did, we could live off that, right? But, you know, we can't get it all. So, some people so, try. Yeah, some, some are definitely trying. So, so anyway, the, the challenge was to come up with, a, with a, a beverage that contained an optimal mix of protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And as a, a nutritionist and a food scientist, did it discovered quickly that, of course, dairy for from cows is actually not optimal for humans in terms of uh, energy percentage contribution from the macronutrients. So, so he started thinking around that. And it, interestingly enough, if you look at, for example, human milk and the nutritional composition of human milk, it's much closer to that of oat milk or the oat milk that we launched, right? And there's a, there's some somehow an interesting message at the uh, behind there. Milk is certainly has been a great contributor to western particularly western civilization but yeah other civilizations like the maasai in eastern africa and whatnot that are naturally lacto tolerant in terms of of a, you know poor nutrition and whatnot we were happy to have our cows there that feed us but but uh, when, when we in, in today's modern society, a lot of nutritionists will argue that the, the, the nutritional composition of dairy is maybe not optimal anymore. That's a whole other conversation, but that's how it all started. And he landed when he did his research in oats being uh, the, by far the most interesting uh, raw material in terms of nutritional composition, but maybe more importantly, uh, taste. Uh, taste is king. If you whatever you make is good and it doesn't taste good, people are not going to uh, latch on to it. So, so you have to lead with taste, and in anything you do, and then you can, uh, to a certain extent, uh, micronutrition, vitamins, and whatnot. That's easy to add to any product if you need to and if you want to, right? But you need to get the right protein quality. Uh, oats obviously adds dietary fiber, which is a very important nutritional component and, and one of the most important reasons or lack of dietary fiber is one of the most important uh, contributor to, to malnutrition and nutrition in, in the Western or in the, the, in the developed world, I should say today, right? Lack of dietary fiber. So it's a really important aspect of, of an oatmeal to add that uh, nutrient to, to the daily diet. Uh, so that's a little bit of this scientific sort of thinking behind it and, and and he came up with an oatmeal patented it in 2000 i'm sorry 1994 1995 and uh, one of the other aspects as he started zooming in on oats as the optimal raw material was that of course oats is well known to reduce ldl cholesterol the bad cholesterol so he very early on in his thinking looked at how do i not only maintain that property in my beverage, but actually also optimize it. Um, so very early in the design thinking, he, he did something that I think still today is really unique in the food industry. It is that we start looking at clinical trials and bring in the medical profession into the pie and, and, and optimize the medical functionality. So you could argue that the oatmeal he launched was really the first true functional food, right? It, it's five published, uh, I believe four or five published clinical studies shows that oatly and oat milk, the oat milk he came up with is actually extremely potent at reducing LDL cholesterol, uh, which was of course a really key part. I joined my brother in 1997 after selling my software company and I decided I wanted to do something new with my life, uh, not just computer security. and you know, that's a logical career move to go from computer security to oat milk. 
as everybody would realize and 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 um, uh, and started having fun with the, taking this uh, new innovation and trying to figure out what to do with it. And, and of course, uh, early days targeting and playing on the strength of the product, targeting uh, people that need uh, uh, to address uh, their cholesterol levels, but also vegans and, and lacto, uh, lacto intolerant, but maybe more importantly, milk protein allergic people. Uh, we did a couple of trial errors, uh, trial runs with different uh, commercial plans and decided in 2001 to go all in behind the consumer brand. And that's when Oakley was born. So, you know, today we are almost 20 years later, a 20, 20 year old overnight success story. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah and, and, so Sweden's, Sweden's um, market share, or at least market share in Sweden is massive, right? Yeah, I, I don't exactly uh, uh, know the current level today, but Oatly is by far the dominant player in, in Sweden with over, I would think, over 50% market share of total plant-based. So that includes all, you know, almond and all other categories, right? And, and yeah, it's a very dominant player there. We were the first to build the Scandinavian market. And, and uh, uh, interesting thing is I believe the Oatly's growth rate in Scandinavia is still very high considering being a, a, a you know if in the food traditional food if you like with the double digit growth and and uh, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting if you compare penetration of plant-based dairy in Scandinavia it's still relatively low compared to markets like here in the US for example so that tells us all that there is ample room to keep growing and keep growing dram fairly dramatically also in quote-unquote mature market from an Oatly point, point of view. When did, um, when did Oatly um, start to spread its wings from, from Scandinavia outside and, and you know, take a more global approach? Well, in, in, interestingly enough, uh, uh, you know, in, in Sweden, like I, I know I spent time in New Zealand, we, we have a lot of similar you know, we're small countries, it's a big world out there and, and our domestic markets are too small for anything really. I mean, it's hard to make uh, a big business out of just your home market. So so we are schooled and trained to look uh, outside uh, the country uh, day one. And in fact, the first oat milk that uh, my brother launched before I even joined him, he launched in the UK before even launching in Sweden. Um, and and then, so when we launched Oatly in 2001, we actually went after the UK and Sweden at the same time. And, and uh, so, so uh, yeah, you have to think, you have to have that mentality. And, and, and uh, interestingly now, when I've been in the US for a few years, I realized that when you talk to US entrepreneurs, they tend to be spoiled with having the luxury of an enormous home market that they discount the rest of the world often right and and maybe look at that as a side you know that'd be nice to have on the margin a little bit of export sales which is exactly the opposite of where we come from and, and if you start combining these two worlds you can really start building exciting businesses and, and i think uh, we've seen that with oakley as we launched in the us in 2016 and we launched actually in asia and china in 2017 so we're we, we, we have that in our DNA. I think it started with the Vikings, right? Conquer the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, was there a point? Because, um, you know, 19 years has been a, um, you know, it's been a long journey. Was there a point where things really started to change um, yes. on the journey where things really started to ramp up? And, and can you sort of elaborate and describe that a little bit? Yeah, no, it's 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 a great uh, I think uh, learning experience and a lesson to share. When you start launching products in markets like the UK and then Sweden, where the dairy consumption is very high and and the dairy penetration and, and the culture around there is very strong, you obviously you have to niche your product into very carefully selected segments, like like I, you know cholesterol uh, lowering properties you target that audience or or vegans or or which in those days were very small groups right particularly in scandinavia the veganism was, was looked upon as those oddballs right which when i say that today it's a very very different story and it's fascinating to see how that changed over the 20 years right 
but but uh, but that's how it was then. And milk protein allergic uh, children was a key cons uh, consumer constituency for us. You have about two percent, I think three four percent of all children, pretty much globally, are born milk protein allergic, and most of them grow out of it by the age of seven or eight or nine. But while they are in that phase, uh, they have siblings, they have parents, they have people around them, and they're all more direct, directly or indirectly affected by it. So the consumer audience is actually much bigger than the, the number would indicate, right? And that was our big starting point in a, in a strong dairy culture that, that's more accentuated. And that's why we launched, you know, to go in with ice cream and creams and, and, and milks to help families with with milk protein allergic children. And we came to a point, I think, in 2011, 2012, where you could say we've saturated these strong or these small niche markets, right? And at the same time, we saw some very dramatic shifts in, 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 uh, in, in, bigger, in the bigger consumer picture, right? Uh, veganism becoming more and more mainstream, at least the movement starting. We saw the realization of uh, and, and the drive for for uh, sustainability all of a sudden impacting much larger consumer groups than than previously, and and so by the time we could uh, uh, we started looking in 2012-13 there we brought on a new management team to really help us position and 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 uh, bring out our story our message of of, of health great taste, great functionality and sustainability combined. And, and uh, uh, in order to, to convince the broader market, we had to really change our appearance quite dramatically and become a, a, a lifestyle brand where our message about a sustainable world could shine through. It was really a key part of driving the building of the company, but in the early days when we were niched, that wasn't the part of the story that was portrayed to the market, right? And, and so we had to really shift. We had to change a lot of staff to get everybody behind this mission. And, and, and uh, I think the, the passion behind our mission has really uh, moved mountains, literally, for us. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're by launching in 2014 into the coffee trade, we had a vehicle to go after the, the new urban modern consumer, very much driven by, by the young millennials and the older Gen Zs. And, and today I'd say that uh, anyone that wants to go into this market needs to appeal to Gen Z or forget about it because they're driving the whole trend. And, and uh, I, I think that was a, a really big part of Oatly's success uh, when we got into this hockey stick development, right? And that really started in 2014 with the launch into the barista um, and the cafe, third wave coffee shops all over the world, right? Yeah, that's been a, um, a skyrocketing, you know, part of that, that, the growth in coffee around the world. Um, you can see hitching the strategy to that has been, um, you know, has delivered. I, I guess from there we'll, we'll parry and segue a little bit into into where um, oat milk and, and alternative um, plant-based dairy sits relative to the existing fresh milk market. So, can you? How's the category growing at the moment? When we talk about the whole plant-based milk category, um, and, and what share does it have in comparison to fresh milk? So, uh, I think that the the uh, it it's, it differs across the world. Uh, quite a lot still, right? Uh, and I think if you look at the US market, it's certainly one of the most developed markets in this category. Uh, I think depending on how you measure, I think if you look at total numbers, uh, the, the, the exact data varies a little bit, but it's somewhere between 14 and 16% of the total dairy categories today occupied by plant-based dairy products. Um, but if you start digging deeper and look at, let's say, Gen Z, for example, you find that the new generation has a much, much higher penetration. And, and uh, then also if you start looking at different types of category of plant-based dairy products, like the white milk is definitely the most developed market. So you look at yogurts and cheeses and whatnot, they have significantly less penetration. 
and and that, that that's worthy of a conversation on its own uh, why that is but but uh, a lot of people look at that as a tremendous growth opportunity for example i think yogurt penetration in the us is maybe five percent right um so but back to the the, the top question i think 18 percent 16 percent in the us in europe it's probably 10 to 12 percent uh, I don't know for a fact where you are in New Zealand now, but I venture to guess it's significantly lower than that still. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the big outlier here, which is a little harder to compare, is China, of course, because China has a strong tradition of making uh, soy milk at home. And, and it could really be debated whether that should be part of a non-dairy type category. You know, China didn't even have a dairy category until 20 years ago, right? When they started building their mm -hmm. milk. So, 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 um, when Oatly launched in China, to, they, we launched a new Chinese character, actually, I believe that was in 2018, because there was no character in the Chinese alpha uh, language describing plant based dairy. So, that was a cool, fun thing that the team uh, came up with. and. Uh, made a big success, a big imprint in China. So, so in total numbers, the Chinese market will dwarf all the other markets when it comes to plant-based dairy, but it's really hard to give a comparative number penetration versus dairy because of the cultural differences. So, so. Yeah, and I guess that, I mean, as I guess the next question for me, just jumping back to your comments around um, non-white non, um, milk, um, plant-based dairy, so cheeses, yogurts, ice creams. So, what, what is it? Is it functionality? What do you think is the? What, you know, what's driving the slower rate of growth in those? Uh, my my, my, my uh, personal belief is is very simple. There's one word: uh, taste. Taste is king. And, and quite frankly, I, I would argue today that uh, we, uh, based on my experience and the proof points we see, you will find today a lot of co consumers of uh, coffee with oat milk uh, that would swear, and they are typically dairy drinkers otherwise, that, that would argue strongly that oat milk tastes better in coffee than cow milk does. And it's a question of, I mean, taste is, it's uh, is some uh, what's the you you that's something you learn over time, right? But the oat milk actually marries the coffee notes extremely well, and and I think if you think about it, if you're a dairy drinker, uh, after drinking your cappuccino or your latte, your mouth is actually covered by dairy proteins, and and that gives you sort of a sticky kind of actually not really pleasant taste. It's just that we're so used to it. Taste is acquired, right? But when you start comparing that with an oat milk blood, you don't have that coating and you have a much more pleasant coffee taste. If you're into coffee, if you're a coffee nerd, and who is not, um, uh, I think people would agree with that statement, right? And that's one of the reasons why plant-based dairy and oat milk in particular is changing the coffee industry dramatically now and fast. And, and coming back to penetration numbers, if I said 16% in, 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 in total dairy, I think you start seeing a lot of ca coffee shops now that are even throwing out milk. They're switching completely to, to uh, oat milk. And that's because they believe, the roasters and the baristas believe it's a better product and, and a lot of consumers with them. How, so if I switch then to dairy, I'm sorry, to yogurt and cheese and, and uh, uh, in particular, uh, you know, it's interesting, right? Uh, we have 20 years of experience of drinking plant-based products and, and making cheese and whatnot from plant-based pro plant products, but humans have been making cheese from dairy for, I don't know, a thousand years maybe. We, we, we all think that we drank milk as cavemen and, and maybe some cavemen did, but really very little dairy was consumed as dairy. Uh, before the 1930s, right? Before pasteurization and, and widespread refrigeration, yeah. because it was just not healthy. But what did humans do? We we made cheese, we made butter, we made yogurts so that we could keep longer and whatnot, right? And that we have refined and learned how to make really good cheeses and yogurts and find the right bacteria and the right yeasts that work in those 
the, uh, in those dimensions, right? Um, and of course, uh, we ju we're just not there yet in the plant-based universe to make uh, the, the top-notch, you know, like I, I challenge anyone that has a good plant-based cheese, come with me to my favorite restaurant in Paris and let's order a cheese place and let's see what we can do here, right? They, 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 we're not even on the same playing field. It, it's, you cannot compare. So of course, plant-based cheeses are starting to nibbling in when it comes to simple cheese dimensions like melted cheeses and maybe cheese spreads and things like that, right? Which mm -hmm. of course can be significant markets, but you're not there yet. We, we It's the casein protein in, in the area that is a necessity to make good cheese. And, and there is no casein in the plant-based world yet. I'm thinking we probably see genetically modified organisms soon where people start putting uh, or, uh, casein in, in plants or, or some similar developments, right? And you could argue the same thing with yogurts. Yogurt cultures have been optimized for centuries to be delivered the perfect yogurt and we're not there with, with the plant-based yet. We're getting better. Every day we're getting better, but we're not there yet. And, and um, I think that's key. I think that, um, that that just brings up two more questions for me, I guess. The first one is about: Do you think that the um, that the vegan attribute of um, of the plant based product line is strong is so strong that it precludes um, you know a complementary product that might be dairy light but get some of the functionality in the in the cheeses and yogurts and ice creams which enables some dairy to give functionality on a mostly plant-based product? Or is, or is the value proposition so strongly connected to veganism that that, that you know, becomes not tenable? Well, it's a good question. And there's certainly uh, uh, companies that have tried. We've seen several examples now, both in Europe and here in the US, where dairy companies add oat milk to their milk. Uh, with the purpose of adding what they lack. What dairy lacks is the dietary fiber, right? And that's obviously the, the key competitive strength, if you like, in, in oats compared to, the, to cow milk. Uh, so, uh, but I think the problem here is the confusion from the consumer. We haven't seen anyone do it successfully because I think consumers get confused. What is it and why? And, and I think the dairy industry still has a problem promoting that the right way because however they promote a mixed product they will in one way or the other badmouth so to speak their own original product that they're making such a big deal about heralding and you know the holy milk right and now so why would i dilute the holy milk with this you know evil intruder and and um we've certainly seen there is try both here in the US and in Europe, and, and they have royally failed. So, so why that is, I, I really don't know the, the exact, but I, I do believe the confusion on the consumer side and the combined with poor branding positioning. I think that type of product, like any true change, has to come from outside established players because they, they are unfortunately stuck in their rut. And, and it's really hard to break that, you know, you have to, fire half the management team and start all over to get the true change and, and that's not going to happen so that's why change comes from outside yeah um i'm going to jump slightly backwards and then i'm going to keep going forwards but i just wanted the, the last piece i wanted to just quiz you on around um you know market share and where where oat milk fits within or oat drink or, you know how we describe it fits within the alternative bracket it seems to me that um you know Pretty much everything's being milked at the moment to create yeah. a plant-based product. Yeah. So it's becoming a crowded category. Um, how does how does oat milk fit within the category and its market share within plant-based? Um, as far as you know, uh, market share as well as um, growth rates. Yeah. So so in Europe and and. Uh... Throughout the uh, first world, I would say, oat has now taken the leadership position as far as growth rate by a long shot. It's outgrowing everything else. Uh, it was interesting just the other week, the other month here in the US, uh, it was official that oat category passed soy category. 
to be number two. And I think the old category growth rate in the US right now is around 350% year over year. Whereas uh, the number one, the, the incumbent leader with uh, around 60% market share in the plant base is almond and the almond growth is you know, single digit. So uh, uh, a lot of analysts are predicting and betting, and I think you can go on Ladbrokes and play on it. When is Oat going to overtake Almond? It has already done so in several key markets in Europe. So uh, I think a lot of people think it's just a matter of time. And, and, uh, uh, I find it really interesting on the Almond piece, you know, where Oat started about trying to minimize intolerance um, from a lactose perspective, and you know, where the where the leader in that plant-based space is at the moment is um, is almond, which has got its own intolerance, you know, bracket. You yeah. know, it's a, a different, entirely different. Yeah. Uh, than it was when it started. I, I, you know, I like to provoke provoke my friends in the almond milk industry. A milk itself is is obviously a controversial term uh, that we could talk about, but. There's roughly about 2% almonds in, in most of the almond milk recipes that are out there today, 2%. So, so could you call that almond? I mean, it's, it's an almond flavored water, really. And the nutritional composition, uh, take it from me, I'm representing the oat world, right? So I'm neutral and I'm biased, of course. <laughs> but but, but it's, it's, uh, I think uh, it, the reason almond took that strong position, it used to be, the category used to be dominated by soy. Soy had a clear issue with taste. There was only a certain amount of consumers that were ready to accept the taste of soy milk. And the soy milk quickly saturated that category, but could not push the ceiling upwards. So already, you know, 10 years ago, when we started looking at the US market, we started talking about the unsatisfied uh, plant-based dairy consumer, right? That was looking for a solution, forced to take soy milk. Almond came and gave a more uh, pleasant taste profile to a large, larger number of uh, consumers, and, and uh, quickly, you know, nature adores uh, vacuum. It filled that space and completely took over soy milk, but didn't add nutrition, didn't add functionality, and that's why oats is now chasing almond quite dramatically, right? And and and. Uh, Almond also has, of course, huge environmental issues with its water consumption. Yeah. So. Um, I think that's a that's the perfect segue into ESG. Um, there's a, there's a couple of things, you know. I guess social responsibility and environmental impact, I guess, is core to the entire category's value proposition, um, and it's resonating more and more. I guess with you know that high value consumer, and we're talking about Gen Z. Um, there's a couple of things in there you mentioned before around genetic, you know, GM, um, GMO into uh, creating casein in a vat or other. Um, I guess the same thing can be said for, for water usage. It can be said for you know carbon footprint or all sorts of things around issues. Um, I guess what do you think are some of the barriers um, to plant-based alternatives when we're thinking about um, ESG and or other? Um, around creating, you know, continuing to capture market share. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think in you, if you look at the trends right now, there's nothing in the white milk space that indicates that there is a particular barrier for future growth there. I, I think uh, a lot of analysts will agree, and then the more people that look at study this market, there's, uh, in fact. Although we see a tremendous explosive growth, there's a lot of indications of saying that we haven't even seen the beginning of the real growth in this particular field. Uh, we haven't reached a tipping point yet, uh, which, when you s put it that way, is maybe may you know mind-boggling, right? But but uh, for the taste reason, for the uh, fact that Gen Z, which in just a couple of years now will be the world's largest and um, the most uh, uh, the, the spending consumer category of all and in the history of mankind and and they are not dairy consumers the dairy industry has lost them period well not a hundred percent right but compared to what they used to and and and, and 
they are dictating the conditions. And if you don't win the hearts and minds and souls of Gen Z today, you are toast tomorrow. And, and uh, unfortunately, the traditional dairy, white milk dairy, is toast tomorrow. Um, but we talked already about the the, uh, the other. Uh, in order to show that same growth in in other categories, yeah, there needs to happen things, right? So that plant based can show the same quality or even better quality. And and um, so there is room for for food tech entrepreneurs here, definitely. Um, it's interesting to see that Impossible has built uh, uh, Impossible Food has built uh, a successful meat alternative category actually based on using genetically modified uh, organisms to produce one of their key ingredients and, and just a couple of years ago gmo was an absolute definite no no take it away no starter and, and they have come in and they've changed that concept right away um, so so i think there's still a lot of consumer skepticism against gmo but I think um, that might change quickly. Uh, and and uh, uh, I think we, we will be looking at different uh, alternative solutions there. Do, do you think, um, so just for, for viewers, I think I'm sure some of them will be asking, can you put any figures or any view around, um, around oat milk's um, carbon footprint, you know, end to end? Yeah, I mean, I, I encourage everybody, I encourage everybody to go to Oatly's uh, homepage, Oatly.com, right, and download yeah. the environmental report. The Oatly has spent a lot of money in doing, you know, from doing this the right way and, and outsourcing, working with third-party organizations to really uh, measure the car, the, uh, the uh, environmental footprint, whether it's uh, acreage use, uh, water consumption, uh, uh, and of course, carbon dioxide emissions and and the number seven comes up as a good, as a rule of thumb, comparing oat milk to to cow milk, right? It's about seven times less polluting, less water consumption. I mean, by polluting, I mean carbon or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, and, and about the seventh of the water uh, footprint and about a seventh of the uh, uh, land uh, aerial usage. So that's a pretty dramatic shift right there. Yeah, that's again, that'll be against the average, I'm assuming. Yeah, the global average. Yes, of thinking. course, a Zealand, global Zealand. absolutely right, because there are local mm -hmm. New Zealand. I happen to be visiting some of your old farms and, and, and dairy farms down there a couple of years ago. Uh, you clearly have a, a, a better situation than, than, let's say, Scandinavia, where our harsh winters uh, make us have to spend a lot of energy keeping the cows warm and keeping them indoors and whatnot, right? So, so uh, yeah, it's absolutely, um, but, but uh, as an average, and, and, uh, and uh, if people go there and read, I, I haven't been involved in the details of this in the, lately, so I, I don't know exactly how they measured and, and all that, but it's all in there. It's very well explained and, and, and uh, it's an interesting read. Um, uh, and I, I think that's a, a great place to jump quickly into the consumer. You know, giving consumers products that they can easily consume and feel good about themselves because they're having a, you know, an impact. Um, you know, it might be, you know, as a serious driver into why the, why the plant-based um, market is growing so rapidly. What, what's your views on, on what's, what the, the real key things for consumers around why they're choosing um, plant-based, uh, you know, why they're making that choice? Well, I, th I think today there's no doubt that sustainability uh, is, is a key driver. Uh, sustainability has uh, driven a whole new uh, wave of uh, uh, veganism, although maybe not 100% vegan, but three day or five day a week with vegan or whatnot, and uh, driven uh, um, an awareness of, of uh, uh, the issue and, the, uh, and people, you know, storms and, and uh, fires in California. And, and uh, we, we, there's, a, there's a very broad concern among many uh, large consumer groups that we have to change. We have to do better. We have to do something, right? And, and when they're parents of products that, coming back to, you know, consumer acceptance before, that 
in terms of, of uh, taste, in terms of functionality, works as well, if not even better in certain situations, then the shift is easy to make and you feel good about that. But you don't compromise taste. You would never compromise taste at the end of the day. We mm. humans don't do that. So, so uh, um, but there's no doubt that that's a key driver, uh, uh, very much so. And, and, uh, uh, and, and it's driven by the, uh, the older Gen Z's, younger millennials that in turn in impact their parents and, and their grandparents. And, you know, it, it sort of spreads like, like rings on water and, and uh, impacts the entire uh, uh, consumer behavior pattern in all, in all ages and all consumer groups. Um, you, you mentioned before about, uh, so I think I know where your answer is going to go here, but I'm, I'm going to ask the question anyway, um, around, around traditional um, dairy's position, I guess, in the fresh milk market and in, um, and in products, um, cheese and yogurts, etc. into the future. I guess, wh where do you see traditional dairy's role in nutrition over the next 10 years? You know, it's a great question and it's something that, uh, I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm sort of in some way parts uh, partly responsible for 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 the change here uh but i'm not a negative i'm not an anti-dairy person so to speak right I, I used to grow up as a kid i i hand milked cows because in my summer place in northern sweden we were next to a dairy farm they had all of what 15 cows or something right and, and my heart really goes out to a lot of these family-owned dairy farmers that that suffer today, and and it's really not their fault. It's 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 you know the dairy industry, the modern dairy industry, uh, in all Western world, with maybe one sole exception, which happens to be where you guys sit, right? There would be no dairy industry the way we see it today had it not been subsidized by the taxpayers. I think that's a really important factor to keep in mind. What does that do? You will you dope an industry, uh, and the government basically promises the farmers, "We'll take care of the, you know, just produce. We'll take care of it. We'll promote it in schools, and we do all this and that." It has taken away the whole element of what drives any product development in any food industry. What does the consumer want? You know, I think we're going to need to, I think we will see, and I think we started seeing that already, a premiumization of dairy that we have never had before, where local artisanal and, and you know, and small scale and where happy cows are out grazing on the fields and look pretty and cute and actually are part of the solution to, to um, uh, the carbon issue and sustainability issue. Um, uh, where where they properly managed to help increase the carbon dioxide that's bound in the soil, right? There's ample studies and results showing that the, the cows in itself is not the problem. They can be part of the solution. The problem is the big farm, uh, farm I mean, the big dairy industry. The, we have a here in California. Anyone that's been here and driven Interstate Five South from from San Francisco to Los Angeles, there's a stretch in in Central Valley where we locals refer to cowshits. You pass one mega dairy farm after the other. It's the most awful, horrible experience you can imagine. It stinks. The soil is awful. You see these cows packed on top of each other in what used to be a semi desert. So they put in these enormous roofs to give some shade for the pork cows right and then they force i mean it's just a mess no wonder there is so many people reacting to the poor animal husbandry practices and principles and you feed them antibiotics and you do all the wrong things right that has to end that has to go away we have to kill that part of the dairy industry but we need to help the local dairy farmers to be part of the convert and be part of the solution. We still all want to enjoy a really good premium butter or a good yogurt or a good cheese or for those who want to even a good premium, really nice glass of milk, right? Uh, we are not going to kill the cows just because plant-based superseded them, right? We, you know, there are millions and millions of cows out there. So I think. It's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. 
it has to hurt because the, the, it's built on on the you know doped principle of government subsidy, which is always bad. Uh, and and uh, but somehow in there there's a silver lining, there's a hope. I think as as a industrialist, as an entrepreneur, I I see exciting opportunities in, in a new type of dairy industry that has to come. Uh, well, I, uh, I like the positive note there to what does sound like a bit of a black cloud, but it's good. I, I appreciate it. Um, and I, and I, I agree. I'm with you 100%. Um, I, I think New Zealand's well placed for that, which is great for us. Um, we're going to so. have one more question before we jump into, um, before we jump into Q&A. Um, and it's around, you know, New Zealand businesses often aspire to kind of, to be globally, globally relevant. It's a big, um, you know, it's a goal for many, um, but expansion outside of home markets can be really a challenge. Um, I guess it's taken only 20 years, but uh, you know, there's a there's a there's some success story there which would be great to share. Um, can you share sort of some of the challenges that that you guys went through breaking out of Sweden and into a global market, and and what lessons can you share with others? Oh, uh, yeah. And, and I'd be happy to engage more on, on the, you know, if people are, are want to dive deeper into that. It, it's a very big question, right? It, it, it's it, it, it's not unfortunately not as easy as like, well, there's one and you know, there's these three things. You nail those, you're done, right? Um, uh, but but I think it really starts with a mental mindset. Uh, I, I sort of after all these years, that's what I keep coming back to. You need to have owners and investors and, and a board that is prepared to to risk jumping a pond, going to another shore and, and establishing a beachhead, right? Um, and I think, you know, there, there's a lot of successful export industries coming out of my part of the world. And, and, and I think it's because we have a culture of daring, right? And do that and, 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 and uh, all these classic uh, terms now, fail fast, go test and test and, and come back and regroup and go back, uh, go back at it again, right? Don't expect quick and easy successes. I have to say that the people coming out of New Zealand, you have an incredible advantage in one aspect. You have an incredible brand, New Zealand. There's no one that dislikes you anywhere, right? And you represent quality and all the, you know, a lot of good attributes. Um, so use that to your maximum advantage. Brilliant. I like it. We're going to jump into some Q&A now. There's tons of it. We had some pre, um, pre-questions pre set up um, that, that people will put in when they signed up and we've got a whole lot to come through live. Um, the first one I'm going to ask, and we'll try and get through these as quickly as we can. Um, there's been a number of questions come from, through the, from the audience around the term milk to describe plant-based alternatives. And one of the things I noted, you know, from Oatly's perspective, you guys actively market your product as an oat drink. I don't think anywhere on your website do you call it oat milk. Um, you know, it's oat, it's oat drink, it's oat gurt, it's not yogurt, it's, it's branded differently. Has that been an intentional process to, I guess, take the argument away? Or is it something that's based on regulation in Europe? I, can you, can you um, add any comment on that? Well, certainly, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a factor of region, regional or, or the local red legislation. I think most companies refer use the term milk here in the U.S. right now. Uh, uh, so plant-based milk, right? Where you cannot say that in Europe. And, and uh, there is certainly uh, some new legislation in the European Union that going to make it even harder to even compare to, to yogurt and, and whatnot. I think uh, in my mind, and I know the team at Oatly uh, looks at it a very similar way today, that that um, it, it's kind of a mute point because in the mind of the consumer, it's a milk. Uh, whether you can call it that or not, it's almost irrelevant. It's, it's the dying dinosaurs last desperate try to kill this up, uh, upstart that's hurting them right uh, by trying to make them i mean it's dairy lobby that's what it is and, and it has no connection to what the consumer if you drink something that's white that that uh, flavors your coffee it, it's it's a co it's a milk 
you know, it's, uh, and, and that's what it is. And you're going to call it that when you talk to your neighbor and your friend. Uh, if whether you know it's illegal or not, uh, up until the point maybe the police start stopping you in the street and say you can't do that and fine you, I don't think that will happen, right? So, so it, it, to a very large extent, it's a mute point. It, it's just a question of following uh, local regulations. I think any company in the plant-based uh, industry would want to call their milks milk if they were allowed to everywhere, because that's what the consumers already call it. Yeah. Um, the next question is: We briefly talk, talked about ESG and uh, you know that being core to the proposition. Um, I guess the question, uh, the next question is: Is there any issues? Are there any ESG issues that that face the plant-based um, category and or the oat milk specifically? That oat milk category. Uh, so uh, you have to repeat the question. I didn't quite understand well, are, are it. Are there any ESG um, challenges that um, environmental, social, or um, or governance challenges that uh, face the plant-based industry that, that that they need to deal with? Do you think, or whether that, that oat milk needs to deal with? Well, apart from naming, I think uh, which we do already discussed, right? In terms of of uh, otherwise, I don't see any issues, right? There is no real uh, uh, risk factor on the horizon here that, you know, um, I mean, apart from 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 uh, other things we talked about, consumer uh, view on, on, let's say, uh, mod genetic modification or, 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 or whatnot, right? But but uh, I, I I don't really see any any uh, major risk factors in that na of that nature. Um, presumably, I guess water use and within almonds, I guess is a, is a is a big one that fits in there. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yes, if you go down and dig on each and individual raw material, you can identify. I mean, soy production uh, you cannot necessarily tie it out to soy milk per se directly but uh, the uh, Amazonas uh, the Brazilian farmers are busy kind of chopping down uh, the Amazonas to plant soybeans right so of mm. course uh, most of the drive for that is to sell actually <laughs> sell soybeans to China for, to, so they can feed their cows uh, and, and so yeah there that you know but but um, uh there's scarcity of plants we've seen you know like like palm oil has uh, been very controversial for its reasons uh you can certainly see uh, uh is it smart to make coconut milk from that point of view then and, and, and uh but but i mean anyone that that does its own work and work with crops and i think there's plenty of new opportunities there are other crops out there that haven't been used and exploited yet and there are interesting plants in in in, in latin america or in africa for that matter that could potentially be interesting exciting raw material that could help develop the local economies uh, at the same time as that would provide the, the world a uh, new interesting raw material um, yeah, great. The another question here. Um, you know, I think you mentioned before coming down to New Zealand uh, and, and looking at our existing industry for for growing oats. Um, is there any strategy um, or any players in New Zealand that you are watching around uh, manufacturing um, in Australasia that are, who are manufacturing in Australia, or is that something that Oatly is thinking about? So uh, uh, when I came down there in 2013 and, and, and a couple of years uh, subsequent uh, after, we've been looking at, uh, in those days, we talked about potentially uh, partnering, building a plant down there and whatnot. The problem, the challenge for, for New Zealand in that point of view is that you don't really want to ship water long distance, right? So so. So I think uh, the, the advantage uh, from an oat dimension that New Zealand has is that you have extremely high quality oats. Uh, you could probably grow that and you should look at process processing oats, but ship not water and ready-made products because it's not the way to do it, but you can ship the raw material and, and maybe uh, you know have a high value raw material that, that people would pay well for it's kind of like like don't uh, repeat the same mistake that Frontera did or, or the dairy industry did with 
producing some of the best milk in the world and what do you do with it? Well, we, we spray dry it and sell it on the commodity market as a milk powder. It, it's, you know, you ended up there. It's unfortunate and, and, and a missed opportunity to build a brand of true quality, right? Uh, and I think, um, uh, so, so there's a ample opportunities, I think, there as the oat industry develops. And in, in my other persona, when I work with, with uh, I mean, we are, we are involved in, in, in a couple of other companies. My brother and I started a food tech uh, company called Adventure, where we do a lot of research into and develop new food products, targeting health, uh, specific health issues too, and clinically, with clinically proven uh, health medical effects but part of the work we do there has been looking at new new ways of processing oats and new oat varieties and we map the oat genome and, and, and to really understand and go deep into the oat dimension and, and, and we only see incredible upside and potential there how you can take a crop that has been more or less uh, regarded as a secondary crop around around the world for for many generations now and it could be converted into something much, much more valuable because there are so many interesting aspects of oats that, that uh, we haven't exploited yet. Um, this is a question from that's just popped up for myself. Is there a, is there a, um, a big dried or powdered oat um, milk market? Is it a thing? Is it a product that's out there now? And you buy it on the shelf and buy a powdered pouch instead of a liquid product? Yeah, I think there is. I think I've seen some products uh, for sure. It's, it's certainly a marginal thing, and 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 it's a question of uh, you, if you can make a powder without going the wet uh, step and then dry it, right? Then you could probably have something competitive. But that's extremely difficult to make uh, and uh, make it uh, high quality. So yeah. to the extent that you have to make a liquid milk uh, and then spray dry it uh, or otherwise dry it, then just add cost you can never be competitive so so um uh it, it had i think there would be a market uh, down the line for instant oat milks for sure in certain situations right why not mm. uh but uh we haven't seen anyone with a good solution for that yet okay we've got time for um two more quick questions first one is um how important is positioning um alternative milk products next to traditional dairy milk in supermarket shelves. Currently in New Zealand, the majority of um, alternative milks are in a different section entirely, traditional white milk. Do you think that yeah. is a, you know, where do you see that? I think that's a very important, uh, you, you've seen hands firsthand here in the US that when that started happening, that's when it was easy for the consumer to go, should I try it? Oh, no, I'll try that one or, or this one, right? Uh, and it, it, it's, it's strengthening the mindset of a consumer that this is actually a one-to-one -one replacement mm -hmm. uh, for functionally, functionality or whatever. I mean, you bake bread with oat milk. It makes the best bread you ever made. The oat fiber yeah, you know the oat fiber maintain make the bread maintain most moist better, right? So, so uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I think the the placement in retail is absolutely critical. Um, brilliant. And uh, the last question uh, we got we got um, a minute left. Capital and access to capital um, in uh, within the sphere growing rapidly. I guess you know is it easy? Uh, or is it a challenge to, to access capital to grow? I think it's extremely easy right now because there's, uh, I'm sitting here in California and San Francisco, which has the last three, two, three, four years become the world capital of food tech funding. And there's, there's so many people coming here now with bags of money looking for uh, companies to invest in because the word is out in Wall Street that invest in food tech, that's the future. Everybody's seen the incredible returns on the investment in Beyond Meat, right? And now everybody is looking for the next Beyond Meat. Um, uh, the problem a lot of these investors have is that they lack competence. They don't really know what to look for. But there's more, I would argue, there's more money looking for companies than there are companies seeking money right now, right this second, right here. So, so that makes it uh, an excellent time. And, and a lot of these 
funds are looking specifically for plant-based, right? Plant-based dairy, plant-based meat, plant protein. Um, so, so uh, yes, it's a good time. If you have a good solution, good team, interesting story, uh, you can get it funded. Okay, that um, has been a fantastic discussion, um, Bjorn, and uh, we've had an absolute ton of questions that we've run out of time to answer. Um, so I might follow up with you directly after this, Bjorn, and we'll see if we can just get some email answers back to those who have asked and haven't had a chance sure. to, to sure. hear them voiced. Um, uh, a very, 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 very grateful thanks to you for, for joining us. Um, on your screen, viewers, now is a sign-up page. If you would like to join um, for some of our future sessions that we have, um, head on to nzx.com and you can sign up there. Um, uh, we, we're unfortunately, Bill, we're not going to have a lobby session to have a chat after this, but so I'm going to um, I'm going to wrap up now. Um, we might catch up uh, with a phone call later on. But uh, to our audience, thank you so much for joining. To Bjorn, thank you very much for that for that session. Absolutely uh, you know, enthralling. So we will say goodbye now and uh, thank you all. Thank you. Great being here. Brilliant.